This is CBC Here and Now. Waiting on the wind, seven dolphins remain trapped in Heart's Delight, Islington. Oh, I've just been slimed at Burgio Academy. <laughs> Coming up on Here and Now, I'll take you inside the doors of the school and we'll find out what makes it tick or stick. What is this? <laughs> what a mess. It is tough, but you gotta keep on going ahead and hopefully that the rest of them will try and follow in your footsteps. More than just a race, 17 teams compete to be champions in the Trek Terra Nova. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper in St. John's. And I'm Anthony Germain uh, here in probably one of the biggest stories in the province is getting attention around the country as well here in Heart's Delight, Islington, where, as Debbie mentioned, we have seven dolphins. I haven't seen seven since I arrived here this afternoon, counting five or six. Some people saying they're getting a little slower. Here's the very latest that we do know. These creatures behind me, every now and then they'll pop up. They've been here since Sunday. They've been trapped for several days, largely because northeasterly winds have driven the ice into this harbor here and they can't get out. Every now and then uh, a good Samaritan takes his boat out there and tries to shave off a little bit of the ice, but so far they've had no place where they can go. Earlier today, I spoke with somebody at DFO to find out just what might be in store for these dolphins. Right now we're waiting for the weather to cooperate and uh, hopefully drive the ice outside the harbour and then uh, hopefully they can uh, swim freely into uh, Trinity Bay. And what sorts of options will you be looking at if Mother Nature does not help these creatures? If uh, Mother Nature doesn't uh, cooperate and uh, we see something unfortunate like where they strand themselves on the beach, uh, we'll look at uh, relocating them ourselves to another area. Can you walk me through that? Because that, you know, these are seven large animals, they're wild creatures. How do you go about catching six or seven dolphins and, and getting them out of this situation? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the issue is they are large animals, about 400 pounds each. Um, many officers will be needed to assist with this uh, task. But uh, the main thing is they would literally have to be beached or somewhere where they can be controlled. So we wouldn't corral them at this stage now because as you see, there's lots of open water and we would not be able to get them at this time. Right, so if this ice were to move in more, you mean that they will beach themselves? They'll have no choice, yes, because they're, they're scared to go underneath the ice and they would go, they would just stay in open water until they actually grounded themselves. Right, but I guess right now, if you go out there, they're just going to try to get away from you. Exactly, it'll just swim away as soon as we get near them. Right. All right, so what we want then is for Mother Nature to get the winds in the right direction to push that ice so we don't have to actually extract these animals. Exactly, that is the ideal situation, yes. So one of the fears uh, when they actually talked about the possibility of bringing an icebreaker here is the ice would actually push the ice towards these animals. So the best bet really is that option that Mike discussed, and that's Mother Nature. Will she help out or not? Well, the best person to answer that question is Carolyn Stokes. Carolyn? Well, Anthony, we know that the wind direction is going to be changing, but whether or not it's going to help those poor dolphins it remains to be seen. This is what we're looking at. We've been having this southwesterly wind uh, go through Hearts Content, which is uh, our Hearts Desire, which is right here. You can see those southwesterlies tonight will change to northeasterlies. You can see those arrows there. So that will continue on through tomorrow until uh, later on in the afternoon when it will turn into an easterly. And I'm told that an easterly wind may be the best bet for these dolphins. So hopefully we can hang on to those easterly winds for a while and push that ice out to sea. For the rest of us tomorrow, we do have a system on the way. Not going to hit until later tomorrow afternoon. It's going to start with some freezing rain, some snow. Not going to hit until around 3 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon and continue throughout the evening overnight into Friday. So I'll have uh, details about amounts and all of that coming up later. It affects your wallet and our province's future. And on Tuesday, the province is bringing down its budget and we'll be here to deliver it to you. What's cut and what's not, it's an important budget. Join us here in the lobby of the Confederation Building at 2 o'clock Island Time on Tuesday. We'll report live on Facebook and CBC Radio 1. So get your questions to us on Facebook and by using the hashtag NLBudget2018 on Twitter. That's 2 p.m. on Tuesday. We'll see you then. 
Well, the latest political poll puts Dwight Ball near the top of the pack when it comes to the popularity of Canadian premiers. A quarterly poll from Angus Reid says Ball is third in approval ratings behind the premiers of Saskatchewan and B.C., who are actually tied at 52 percent. The poll says Ball has a 42 percent approval rating. It's a 7 percent jump for the province's premier, who has struggled with popularity since coming to power. 48 communities in this province can look forward to new and improved roads, water systems and what government calls community-oriented infrastructure. Today's announcement is a peek into what's in Tuesday's budget. Premier Ball announced over $10 million for municipal capital works projects. It's part of the province's three-year municipal infrastructure program municipalities will throw in about four million dollars. They say it's a drop in the bucket though because of a looming crisis for towns across the province. Many people will often tell me that when you go around our province right now, the biggest single concern that they have is where the next job would come from. We hear this from young people, we hear it from people that are working on projects right now. Where does the next job come from in our province? So it's important that we create those partnerships with our community leaders and with our private sector to be able to do that. Well, starting in June, you'll see changes to parking in downtown St. John's. The harbour front will get rid of its parking meters and will switch to another method. It's part of a larger plan to replace troublesome meters that have been a problem from the start. Here now is Arianna Kellen takes a look at the meters by the numbers. If you're someone who comes downtown regularly, then this is a welcome sight. A damaged meter, free parking. But it's costing the city and taxpayers millions. There are 1,067 parking meters in St. John's. Over 1,000 of these have been damaged over the last several years. At the end of last year, it cost the city $1.4 million to fix these. This is how it works. Thieves see these as an easy cash grab. They lob off the tops of the parking meters, then take the cash that's inside, usually $10. Now it's more of a cup holder than a parking meter. Over 90 incidents of vandalism have been reported to the city and people have been charged. It's very frustrating. What's more importantly is it's so tight for money at our city. I mean, every penny counts and now we've got to go and pay for something we already have. And the money that these people get out of here is only like $10. These meters were only purchased a couple of years ago at $474 a piece. Now the city is looking at a new plan over the next five years, one that includes phone apps, permits and more. So does the city feel buyer's remorse? We've learned, of course, but who thought this would have happened? The company we bought these off has never seen this in anywhere else they put them in. They've had some incidents, but never a thousand out of, like, that's almost all of them have been damaged at some point in time. Parking meters here on Harbor Drive will soon switch to a pay-by-app system. That will take effect in June. The first street in yet another overhaul of parking in downtown St. John's. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. The big blue tent is coming back to St. John's. The Iceberg Alley Performance Tent made its debut last fall. It's a musical festival under a circus tent at Kitty Vitty Lake. Today, organizers lifted the curtain on this year's lineup. But some people are upset set by who won't be on stage. Here and now, Zach Gowdy has more. For 10 days last fall, thousands of people were caught under the spell of a big blue tent. The Iceberg Alley Performance Tent brought a new kind of concert experience to St. John's, the excitement and amenities of an outdoor music festival, but warm and dry in a way that outdoor concerts around here seldom are. The festival got generally rave reviews with one complaint, there were few female performers. Still, excitement was high for the big reveal of this year's lineup. It's a wide range of genres, from rock and rollers like Big Wreck, Matt Mays and the Trues, pop stars like Rhea May, Sean Hook and So Unreal, country rocker Steve Earle, country western star Dallas Smith, and a night of Newfoundland music with Celtic Connection, Shani Ganuck and Alan Doyle. Organizers hope there's something for everyone. People have different musical tastes and genres that they, they look for, and there's not enough money in this economy to go 10 nights straight, so we try to find those artists that are selective and that, we, uh, that will sell tickets, to be honest with you. But on social media, many pointed out what's missing. Women, again. 
So far, Rhea May is the only female headliner. Before the announcement, Juno winner Amelia Curran tweeted, Hopefully Iceberg Alley can muster up more than one female headliner this year. After seeing the lineup, musician Megan Marshall tweeted her disappointment. So I guess every female musician everywhere is simply too busy for this. Hashtag out of touch. Iceberg Alley event manager Seamus O'Keefe responded to Marshall, saying there were a number of female artists who turned them down. There is also one night on the festival calendar with performers yet to be announced. As for the big blue tent, you'll see it popping up here at Kitty Vitty Lake just a few days after Regatta Day. The Iceberg Alley performance tent runs from September 13th to 22nd, and tickets are on sale now. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. High schoolers from around central Newfoundland strapped on their snowshoes today, and they raced in the Trek Terra Nova. As uh, here now's Garrett Barry reports, there's more to it than just running through the woods. The paintball station is the sixth and final station of the Terra Nova Trek race. Once you reach here on Snowshoe, all you got to do is hit the target and get to the finish. 17 teams in an eight kilometer race, some driving more than an hour to line up. Organizers say it's a worthwhile trip. This race is a really unique opportunity for youth to work in a, in a team setting. Try things they've never tried before. This is for some of them, this is their first time on snowshoes. And in the past, it's been their first time on skis, the ones that have done it before. And uh, it's a great place to do it. I mean, Terra Nova has, uh, has beautiful wilderness. It's a wilderness race. So they're likely to see tracks, animals along the way. Leaving the starting line, trekking through the woods. Teams had to start a fire, boil a kettle, and hit their targets six times. The teamwork? It's put to the test. First we were all running and we were, it was going really well. And then uh, Cameron got shin splints, which wasn't fun, but that was okay. He was still going, it was still going great and he was starting to feel better. And then he got galls on his feet, but that was okay. It was all right, it was going good. The race was tight. 90 minutes later, only 30 seconds between the first and second place teams. I was thinking that we were going to be maybe placed third, but I wasn't expecting first. We were, as soon as we found the seven kilometer mark, we just kind of started running a lot then, trying to push it to see what we could get. Uh, not usually that competitive, but I had a group of people and I felt like, you know, I might want to help them get through it too. It'd be nice to get the full group to win, you know. Riverwood Academy in Gander Bay took home the trophy and a box of snowshoes for their school. Garrick Barry, CBC News, Terra Nova National Park. smaller school like allowed us to get like a lot of extra help with like closer relationship with teachers. A trip to Burgio Academy and its declining school population.
Now, to be blameless doesn't mean to be perfect. Sunday service, a time of reflection. It's God's acceptance and forgiveness that remains constant. But this Anglican priest is giving his parishioners even more to think about. My father went out to his shed, took two pieces of old scrap rope he had tied together, and took his own life. I am a survivor of suicide. Tomorrow on Here and Now, the personal side of suicide and his public message. Strong stigma. Let's turn our attention now back to the weather. And as you forecast last night, it was a lovely day today. It Very spring-like. It was. A bit of cloud, but overall it was quite nice. And tomorrow to start, we'll see some clouds, but uh, things are going to be changing tomorrow mm -hmm. afternoon <laughs> into tomorrow night. Let's have a look at the weather on the way headlines. Yes, we have some freezing rain coming for the east on the island. Snowy and windy uh, evening and into Friday uh, coming for uh, the western part of the island and we're going to see a bit of a temperature bump for some areas on Friday. So this is uh, the picture you can see lovely day not much happening pretty quiet some overcast skies, but this is the system that will be heading our way late tomorrow afternoon. But for tonight, uh, you can see that things uh, are, are pretty, pretty good, except we may have uh, this little bit of flurry action overnight tonight for the Avalon Peninsula. Uh, the models are kind of disagreeing a little bit on that, so we, we may get some flurries overnight tonight and as well uh, for parts of Central mostly overcast skies in the west and chance of flurries in through Labrador for tonight. Now for tomorrow, we do have the special weather statement in effect for the entire island and a wind warning in effect for the rec house area. That's because of uh, this system that's moving up here. It's going to hit the south coast tomorrow at around three o'clock. You can see the snow here, the freezing rain here and the showers here. So it's going to be quite a messy evening. If you're in St. John's, you'll start the day perhaps with some of those flurries that came in overnight by the afternoon we could get a, a bit of a break looking at some cloudy skies but then when that system starts to move in we'll have those ice pellets and freezing rain to contend with so that's pretty much the story for the entire Avalon temperatures around the freezing mark so that will determine how much of it is ice pellets and how much of it is rain as we head to central areas it's more of a snow event there could get up to about two to four centimeters uh, for the Gander area. Now more snow coming for the West Coast. Uh, Corner Brook, Gross Morgan, you'll see that much later in the evening. So during the day, you're looking at mainly cloudy skies. And Labrador up through the Straits, chance of flurries there in through Cartwright. And uh, for the rest of Labrador, you really won't feel the impact of this, uh, of this system on the way, but there is a chance of some flurries for some areas of Labrador. So Thursday evening, uh, you can see that it does, it, the flurries do move up into uh, southeastern parts of Labrador and it really turns to showers uh, on Friday afternoon for central areas and for the east. The snow continuing along the northern peninsula. These are the amounts we're looking at right now on the west coast around 10 centimeters plus of snow. Northern Peninsula, uh, about five centimeters of snow, five to 10 centimeters along the south coast there. And in the east, we're looking at freezing rain, rain about 10 to 20 millimeters by the time it's all said and done. And as I mentioned, we may have some milder temperatures coming on Friday, looking at about six degrees in St. John's. I'll have those details and a look at the weekend coming up. But for now, let's go to Heart's Delight Islington and check in with Anthony. All right, uh, people at the end of the workday, of course, uh, have come and they're checking out the situation with the dolphins here. You can see some people behind me who are checking it out, and there's other people over here, and the cars come and go at the end of the day to see what's happening. Now, not much has changed, although they're surfacing right now, uh, right over there, right behind us in the trapped harbor where we are right now with the ice as it is basically locking these animals in. So we talked earlier on the show about how it may come to be that they're going to have to lift these animals out. Well, the person who knows how to do that and who will be at the head of that effort, should it be deemed necessary, is Wayne Ledwell. And I met up with him earlier. They're still alive. They look healthy. They haven't been scrubbed up by the ice. Uh, there's no blood on them. So they haven't been in contact with the ice yet. They just moved ahead of it. So 
Yes, I'd say they're in, they're in stress or they, they want to be out in the open ocean. My understanding is if there is a need to lift these animals out of their situation that you will be the lead person on that, what's involved in that? Well, what would happen if the wind switches around from the northeast here, which is which is the forecast for it to do, it could push all this, this ice that's, that's across the, the harbour here over and come in contact with those animals and push them up onto the beach and more or less beach them. So what we would have to do then is take them and put them in stretchers and carry them, put them in the, in a, in a, in the back of a pickup truck and bring them down to either Islington, which is just a couple of miles up this way, or down to uh, Heart's Desire, which is just a good open slip lane, open water. Now, as someone who understands these animals to a greater degree than most of us, when they look at this, this ice that is all around us here, uh, you, mentioned that, uh, you mentioned to me that they know what this is. Yeah, they know exactly what that is. That's why they're not out into it. They know that to, that, that's, to them, that's dead. To be into that, they can't survive it. They can't. They're, they're too strong to navigate. They're too weak to navigate. Too small to navigate it. The ice gets in and gets on top of them, and they tire out real quick and makes them and and, and roughs them up real bad. So. Is there any hope that somebody? I know an icebreaker can't get in because it's too risky to push the ice and, and distress the animals even more. But would it, be, would it be possible to actually cut a channel? You know, if there was a couple of la large fishing boats in or inside the harbor. Probably they could probably push some of the ice out, and uh, and uh, uh, and they may be able to push push some of it out because the ice breaker can't get in. Uh, one of the problems with that is that the channel closes in uh, in ice, and w with the wind and tide closes it in immediately after the boats have gone through. I don't know if you've seen ice breakers. Sometimes that's what happens, and so these animals w won't just follow a path out. They've probably got to be persuaded to come out of here now because they're, they know they're in a safe area. They know there's that, that stuff out there, what that is. They can hear it scrunching around. So it's, you know, uh, what what would be nice to happen here is this, overnight this would all clear away and tomorrow morning these animals would be gone. We wouldn't have to do anything with them. They, they know they are gone. But if, to cut a channel, it's like, you know, it's, uh, you, you'd have to try to drive them into it and then you risk driving them away from away from that channel into the other ice. So, so they're not just like, you know, they're not going to follow you like a dog would. All right, I'm joined by a young person here who's among the onlookers. Your name is Brooklyn? Yeah. And how old are you? Nine. Nine. So when you look back there and you see there's the, the fins are right there, what do you think? It's sad, but then it's really nice to look at and yeah. it's just a sin. Yeah, it is a sin. That's the word I've heard the most today, people coming here and saying it's a sin. Thanks a lot for your time and let's hope for the best for those dolphins. Yeah. All right, thank you. Bye. Now, uh, one of the benefits of this job working here now is I do get to come to all kinds of places across the island and the province. Eventually, I get to Labrador, visiting beautiful harbors like this. Unfortunately, today, it's for these circumstances. Not so long ago, I got to go to another beautiful part of Newfoundland, and that was Burgio. And while I was there, I visited Burgio Academy, and I want to give you this profile of a remarkable school to take a look at the pros and cons of a school in an outport. Get your book bins, please. I came home in 2000, and I intended to come back for six months, and that was 18 years ago. <laughs> and if you're an outdoor person, this is the place to be. There's a lot of kayaking, and people have cabins, and boats, and trailers. It's a very pretty place, no question. I think it's the most beautiful place on our island. Tell me a bit about these kids. What are they like? Absolutely fantastic. I'm a little bit biased. <laughs> Miss Hare is a really nice teacher. She's fun. <laughs> and we go on lots of field trips. I think in a combined class, sometimes they uh, become more independent. They learn to get along with people who are not in their age group. And the older ones take care of the younger kids from the time they come in the door. We're pretty close, honestly. We have mentoring at our school, so. So what does that mean? What, what does mentoring mean? Um, it's a program, so we, once a week, we all, each of us have like a, a mentee, and like we do like different things with them, so like crafts and like games. And okay, so grade 12s, grade 11s helping out. Yeah, the, the kids. older people. With, it's kind of nice. Yeah. We have 91 students in our school. Uh, we have actually 17 staff completely. We're almost like a, a big family. Uh, you know, everybody knows everybody. Uh, that can be good and bad, but uh, you know, we, we know our our kids. We, we you know, every teacher here knows every kid. The other thing is no one lives here, I say, further than five minutes away from, from the school. It's fairly safe down here. 
And our kids can go outside and play. They can go to the playground by themselves. They can ride their bikes around town and that kind of thing. They can have some semblance of freedom that in a larger centre you may not be able to have. So I mean, if you, you, you're looking at uh, after school support, uh, whether it's, it's with academics or with uh, the sports uh, uh, night times, like for midterms and finals, we have teachers come back to do uh, um, you know, tutorial sessions and whatnot. So, you know, being in, in a small school, there's a lot of advantages, uh, I think, for, uh, for academic piece. I think the smaller school have, like, allowed us to get like, a lot of extra help and like, closer relationship with teachers, and mm -hmm. I think it's been better for us, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing uh, you know, you'll look at is we're away from some of the things that bigger centers would have. You know, like look at Corner Road, you've got Marble Mountain, you know, you've got your, your theaters and whatnot. Um, the cost right now for us to rent a, a school bus to go to, let's say, Corner Road, um, you know, you're looking at probably around 1000 to $1,200. So, I mean, just being away from the bigger centers can be a, a certain challenge. For those of us that have chosen to stay, um, there are a lot of advantages. People make it work. Uh, a lot of the men go away to work and some of the women in the winter time. You try to find things to help you stay here. You know, I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone, uh, I mean, when it comes to rural schools, your enrollment is, is, is reducing. Um, you know, so I mean, uh, you know, what's it going to be like in, in two years time, in five, in ten years time? I mean, uh, the numbers are going to be smaller, we know that, which obviously when it comes to allocations, uh, it's inevitable. we we got to lose uh, staffing numbers. Um, and then it, it, it's taking that and, and trying to create the best uh, curriculum and program we've got for, for all of our students. So once you leave here, what are you going to miss the most about Burgio Academy? The help, probably. Yeah, a lot. And like just the closeness of everybody, like our class only has 12 people and like that's the biggest class in the school, mm -hmm. so it's going to be a lot different. Coming to work with, with dealing with our students, um, you know, our, our community involvement, uh, we have awesome volunteers. Again, I, I think it's just with regards to this one big, big happy family. It's going to be very interesting uh, where we're going to be to in, in 10, 15 years down the road. So I guess time will tell and we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I wouldn't leave this place for anything. You should have asked if I was okay. You should have wanted to know why a 16-year-old was stood on the street. Child sexual exploitation. It happens here. How a criminal exploited a child.
Mel Muse was still a child, only 16, when she wound up in the sex trade. A few years later, this is what she told CBC about the Johns. You have some of them who didn't want to pay you, um, which was a problem for me because if I didn't have the money at the end of the night that my pimp wanted, it was me who was, who was getting better. Um, I had one guy who had a knife. He wasn't, he wasn't going to pay me. Either you do it or, you know, you're not going to be leaving this place, you know. That was back in the 90s. Today, Mel Muse works to help other women move on from the sex trade and exploitation. She wants young people to understand how easy it is to be groomed. Here's part of her story as we continue with our Stealing Innocence series. And a warning, some of the details are disturbing. It started when I was just a teenager. Um, I had had some trouble at home. I had ran away from home and I ended up at a shelter and started hanging out in places probably a 15, 16 year old shouldn't have been hanging out. Um, and I was at a bar one night and this gentleman walked in, tall, dark and handsome, um, got everybody's attention, walked up to me at the bar and said, you've got the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen. And I think that was probably one of the first compliments I ever remember getting. So we started a relationship. Um, of course, when he gave me the compliment, my first thought in my head was, oh my God, he loves me. Um, he brought me nice places, brought, bought me nice things, made me feel really, really special, which is something I don't think I had felt until then. Um, I had always felt like I wasn't wanted or wasn't loved or wasn't needed. So he slowly groomed me into the process, I guess, without me even really realizing what he was doing. Um, over time, I started talking less to my friends and family. So at, at one point, he was probably the only person I would have contact with. I relied on him then for everything. Um, emotional, physical, um, financial needs. It was a real just gaining my trust and, and making me believe that he was the only one that had my best interest at heart. The first time um, that it happened, we were driving, um, we pulled up behind a house and he started having the conversation about how the insurance was due on his car, um, the rent was due, talking about all the money he had spent, you know, on the, the places we had went, the food, the clothing. Um, even the drugs at that point, because I had been, you know, using drugs recreationally up until that point. And he said he just wanted me to go into this house and do whatever this guy said. And I, and I don't think I fully understood what that meant. And then I remember thinking, starting to realize what he was asking me, and I, you know, absolutely not. I, like, I, no way can I do this. Like, this is not something that I had ever imagined myself getting involved with, let alone, I don't even know if I thought it would, it happened here to, to that, you know, and when I thought about things like that, I always thought about the women who were down on the street. I never thought that that could be me or someone like me doing that. So over several minutes of conversation, he would say things like nobody would ever know, um, that he loved me, that um, all I had to do was this one time, I would never have to do it again. It was just gonna have to be this one thing that I had to do and nobody would ever know. And I think coming from a past where I had been um, sexually assaulted in the past and abused as a young child, I think it wasn't that far of a stretch, you know, to say, okay, well, maybe I'll do it this time to help him and, and get money for it and contribute to, to what is going on. So I went in, um, to this man's house and did what he wanted and came out with the money and I remember coming out of the back door of the house and going like, thank God I never have to do that again. You know, it's over. I was 16. Yep. After that, it, it slowly progressed into more visits to houses or parties. Um, he had ads in the evening telegram at the time. Um, and there was other girls who were becoming involved and I eventually ended up, it was almost like you graduated at the end to the street. Um, and, and that's where, that's where most of us ended up. 
So the relationship I had with drugs was, was probably not different from a lot of other people that start using drugs at a young age. I learned um, that drugs were a really good escape from my reality. So then it got to the point where you get up in the morning and have to use drugs to do what you have to do to make the money to get the drugs you have to use. So you, you get in a vicious cycle. The physical abuse didn't start until I started to say no. I was in hospitals you know, several different times with, with different injuries. Um, sometimes it would be bad where I couldn't go out for a few days. There was threats against my family. There was threats against my friends. It got, it got worse and worse as time went on. So here's when I, what I want to say to all the people that walked past me. Um, I want to say that I was there, that I wasn't invisible, um, and that you should have paid attention to me. You should have asked if I was okay. You should have wanted to know why a 16-year-old was stood on the street, because I could tell by people's looks that they knew why I was there. So that was Mel Muse sharing her story of how a criminal exploited her when she was just 16 and how she wound up in the sex trade. Her life is nothing like that now. She works with the Coalition Against the Sexual Exploitation of Youth. She's in a long-term relationship. She's dealt with PTSD and she's off drugs. My life today, I think, in comparison to what it was at some times, is probably pretty boring to some people. Um, I, it, it's really, it's, it's structured, it's um, relaxed, it's, it's good today. Muse works with other survivors, and she also gives presentations to community groups and students, trying to prevent others from going through what she did. For me, it's very empowering to keep telling my story, especially when I know it's benefiting other people to understand the issue, because I think sometimes when you have someone with lived experience that can guide you through some of the different processes, it makes you understand it a little bit more. Well, Muse says the work is fulfilling, and she feels it's what she was meant to do. Tomorrow, in our Stealing Innocence series on child sexual exploitation, we'll talk about possible solutions. High marks for Caitlin Osmond at the World Figure Skating Championships in Italy. Her short program, Skate, is next.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, fresh off her Olympic performance, Caitlin Osmond is ranking pretty high at the World Figure Skating Championships. The Marystown native skated to a fourth place finish after the short program today in Milan, Italy. Never get tired of watching Caitlin. Now, when the 22 year old Olympic bronze medalist finishes up at her last competition of the season, she's coming home. Next month, Caitlin will skate in places like Torbay, Grand Falls, Windsor, and at the arena named in her honor in her hometown of Marystown. And we'll be there to bring you the special moment. You're looking at the harbor here in Hearts Delight, Islington. Coming up after the break, you can see those dolphins popping out of the water. We'll have more.
Welcome back and it's time now to meet our young athlete of the day. And today it is seven-year-old Rylan Maloney. Rylan is from St. John's. He's been playing hockey at Twin Rinks for three years. He currently plays for the St. John's Caps novice team. During the past three summers, Rylan has also been playing golf at Glendenning Golf Club. Way to go, Rylan. You are today's young athlete of the day. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. So young Ryland has the summer and winter <laughs> covered just like the pros. He totally does. <laughs> anyway, so you were uh, saying um, in your earlier weather um, hit, as we like to say, mm -hmm. uh, we've got some bad weather coming, hey? We do. It's going to be a messy Thursday night and a pretty messy Friday, but at least on Friday, it's going to be pretty mild. Okay, good. Well, I'm looking forward to those milder temperatures for sure. Let's have a look. We do have a, a weather, uh, special weather statement in effect from Environment Canada for the entire island. That's because of that freezing rain and snow that's on the way, and we do have that wind warning in effect for the rec house area gusts up to 110 kilometers per hour to tomorrow night. So this is the picture uh, tomorrow morning 10 a.m. Not too bad, mainly cloudy skies. But then as the afternoon afternoon progresses, we have that freezing rain moving in along the south coast. You can see that it uh, is mainly snow here in the west and in central, mainly showers here in the east. Thursday 6 p.m. that uh, will continue on. So we're, we're looking at that mix of snow and ice pellets and uh, freezing rain in the east. This system won't really hit uh, Corner Brook and Gross Morn until the evening hours uh, tomorrow. Labrador mainly unaffected by this system, but you are looking at a chance of some morning flurries along the coast and in Labrador City. So these are the amounts we're looking at right now with the system that's coming in. We're looking at about 10 centimeters plus along the west coast and uh, about five centimeters for the northern peninsula, two to four for the Gander area, five to 10 along the south and uh, 10 to 20 milli uh, millimeters of rain for the east and Buren. So Thursday, 4 p.m. Continuing on here, the snow moves up uh, towards the northern peninsula and into southeastern Labrador. You can see the temperatures here starting to go up Friday uh, at 3 a.m. So very quickly, the, the temperatures start to change and get much warmer, particularly here in the east. Friday afternoon, 1 o'clock, we're looking at about 6 degrees in St. John's, zero on the West Coast, where they're still going to be in those uh, in those uh, those flurries. So yes, periods of snow on the West Coast, that mix of snow and rain for Central, and we're looking at showers and wind in the east. For Labrador in the east, they're looking at those periods of snow that's going to come with those system and a chance of flurries in Western Labrador. So Friday night, things start to clear off here uh, in the east. We are looking at some uh, flurries for Saturday. Saturday. So yeah, the island right across is looking at uh, a chance of flurries on Saturday. Temperatures not too bad above zero, so that's good. And a chance of flurries there along eastern Labrador, but cooler temperatures, sun and cloud in western Labrador. So Saturday night into Sunday afternoon, more flurries uh, on the island. Not too bad in Labrador, though. Uh, you can see it starts to clear off on Monday as well. We have that mixture of sun and cloud on Monday and and Tuesday, so things are looking pretty nice as you begin your work week and a nice stretch of uh, sunshine for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Lab West. So the big thing, of course, that uh, everyone's going to be keeping their eye on is uh, the wind direction over the next few days because of those dolphins trapped in the ice in the harbor of Heart's Delight Islington. And of course, that's where Anthony is right now. And Anthony, Anthony, a lot of people uh, with their fingers crossed and that I the situation will change jump. there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of people that have dropped by, a couple dozen people right here down at the harbor, as well as cars that are coming uh, behind us. As we start to run out of uh, sunlight here, one of those people is uh, Colleen Hindi, who joins me now. Colleen, when I first saw you, uh, you were quite upset by what's happening behind us here. Um, it's really sad, and I, I wish they could do something to, to help them. Yeah, and I noticed you were taking quite a few pictures, and um, y you seemed to be pretty upset by what you were looking at. Yeah, because... I I don't want anything to happen to them, and I I really want them to 
to get them out of there right away because I don't want them to die. It seems as though, you know, they're, they seem to be moving around. Some people say they're moving a bit more slowly than yesterday. I don't know if that's true. Maybe they're saving energy. What, what would you most like, how would you like to see this story end? Happy ending. Yeah, get the, get the dolphins out of there? Yes. Right. Did you come here yesterday as well? Yes. Yeah. Cut, cut, and I was taking pictures and I, and I was so happy, like, that taking the pictures. And I, I just, I just feel happy when I, I just seen them there. And I just don't want them to... But today, be, today when you're here, you're actually crying because you realize they might be stuck here, right? Yeah, and I, I don't want the ice to come in any further and, like, squat them and, and hurt them really bad. Well, with any luck, the weather will change, or if they come in, maybe the, uh, the people at DFO will be able to pull them out and save them. Listen, we'll keep our fingers crossed and, and hope for the best for these, uh, for these magnificent animals. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Debbie, so we'll keep our eyes on the situation uh, here and, uh, and hope for the best. Back to you. Yeah, it's really a heartbreaking uh, situation, and you can see from uh, your guest there how touched she is and, and everybody who is looking at it firsthand. Thanks very much, Anthony, for bringing us a close-up look at the situation. All right, see you tomorrow. Turning now to international news, the suspect in a series of bombings in Austin, Texas, has died. Police have identified him as 23-year-old Mark Anthony Condit. He died early this morning in an apparent suicide as police attempted to detain him. Police say they were following Condit's vehicle on a roadway when he pulled over and detonated an explosive. No motive is being offered for the bombings which killed two people. Well before Condit's identity was confirmed, police swarmed the neighborhood where he lived. Authorities are saying little other than he was unemployed and had no criminal record. He lived with two roommates who are not considered suspects. Well, here's our viewer photo of the day. Beautiful sunshine reflecting off the water puts you in mind of spring. I'll let you know where this photo was taken after the break. Welcome back once again. Some sad news to uh, tell you about. One of the world's most endangered species is now closer to the brink. The last male northern white rhino has died. 
This is video of Sudan from last April. He lived the last years of his life on a wildlife preserve in Kenya. He was under constant guard as protection from poachers. Sudan was 45 years old, and that's equal to about 90 human years. His keepers say Sudan was euthanized this week after being in failing health for months. His death leaves only two northern white rhinos in existence, both female. They are his daughter and granddaughter. Now scientists are hoping to use in vitro fertilization to keep the species from going extinct. Well, on a more upbeat note about animals, animal lovers in the UK are getting their first glimpse of a special new addition to the Highland Wildlife Park. The first polar bear cub to be born there in 25 years is now on display. Caretakers are still working on a name for the little one, and whether it's male or female should be determined by its health check in May. The cub will spend a minimum of two years with its mother, Victoria, Plenty of time to learn all the tricks of life at the park, like hunting for carrots. For now, though, it's never far from Mama. Oh, it's so cute. You just want to cuddle yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. You might get away with that for a little while. Watch the claws. <laughs> Beautiful shots. Yeah, great. I hope, uh, speaking of uh, the animals, that, well, there's an animal here. I mm -hmm. hope they can do something about the white rhino species. Oh, absolutely. Anyway, this is a beautiful shot. Yeah, this was taken uh, in Whitless Bay, Ragged Beach, Janet Doyle. I'm not sure when this was taken, but it was posted on Ryan's Facebook page uh, just a couple of hours ago, so it looks pretty recent. I, I kind of guessed Whitless Bay during the, uh, the break, and I was thinking that might be where the puffins are. I don't know, mm -hmm. but anyway, great shot. Yeah, thanks, Janet. And thanks for being with us, everyone. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Good night.